Welcome to lesson two of the topic Ideas to Implementation, which covers the resolution of the debate over the nature of cathode rays and the discovery of the electron by J.J. Thompson. Last lesson, we examined the evidence uncovered by German scientists about the nature of cathode rays. Pluker discovered cathode rays and demonstrated that they are deflected by magnetic fields. Hittorf demonstrated that they cast sharply defined shadows, so must travel in a straight line. Hertz searched for deflection in an electric field and could detect none. Finally, Leonard demonstrated that the rays could pass through thin metal foil windows in the cathode ray tube and travel a short distance through the air. Most of this evidence, other than the deflection in magnetic fields, pointed the German scientists towards an interpretation of the rays as being a type of light or vibration in the ether. In this lesson, we firstly examine the experiments of English scientists in particular Crookes and J.J. Thompson, as well as that of French scientist Jean Perrin, which pointed towards an interpretation of the cathode rays as streams of charged particles. And finally, we see how the debate was effectively resolved by Thompson when he discovered the electron. In 1869 in London, Sprengel produced an improved vacuum pump which allowed William Crookes and his assistant Gimmingham to produce cathode ray tubes which boasted even higher vacuums than had previously been achieved. And these became known as Crookes tubes. Crookes repeated Hittorf's experiments with higher vacuums and used a Maltese cross which could be flipped up or down as the object blocking the rays. Crookes also studied tubes in which a tiny vane rotated along rails inside the tube. Crookes argued that the rotation of the vane when hit by cathode rays implied that the rays carried momentum and thus must be corpuscular, that is, made of particles. However, later in 1906, after he had discovered the electron and so knew the mass and velocity of electrons in cathode ray tubes, J.J. Thompson calculated that the electron's momentum would be insufficient to rotate the paddle wheel. Instead, he suggested that the cause of rotation was most likely the radiometric effect. The cause of the radiometric effect is quite complicated and was actually later studied by Einstein, among others. But it occurs when a light vane in a rarefied gas is heated asymmetrically, usually by a source of light. But JJ Thompson proposed that in this case it was the electrons heating the vane and causing it to rotate. In 2014, a student and I checked J.J. Thompson's calculations experimentally and we found that, in fact, the electrons in cathode rays have less than 1% of the momentum that would be required to account for the rotation of the wheel in terms of the impact of particles. Our results were published in the journal The Physics Teacher and a PDF copy is available on this website. The upshot is that even though cathode rays are electrons, which do carry momentum, the paddle wheel cathode ray tube doesn't establish that they carry momentum. So far we have examined English and German work on cathode rays. Now we move to France with Jean Perrin, a French scientist who performed experiments that demonstrated that cathode rays could charge an electroscope. He argued that this meant they were constituted of negative charges. In the introduction to his 1895 paper, he gives the flavour of the debate at the time over the nature of cathode rays. Two hypotheses have been presented to explain the properties of cathode rays. Some, with Goldstein, Hertz or Leonard, think that this phenomenon, like light, results from vibrations of the ether, or even that it is light of a short wavelength. We then easily see that these rays might have a straight trajectory excite phosphorescence and act upon photographic plates. Others, with Crookes or J.J. Thompson, think that these rays are formed of matter negatively charged and moving at great velocity. We can then easily understand the mechanical properties and also the way in which they bend in a magnetic field. Objectors to Perrin's experiment had argued that there might be negative charges moving through cathode ray tubes as well as cathode rays, 
but that Perrin had not demonstrated sufficiently conclusively that cathode rays were inextricably tied to these negative charges. That is, perhaps there were both light rays and some secondary cause responsible for the negative charges. J.J. Thompson repeated Perrin's experiment, but this time bent the cathode rays, demonstrating that no matter how the cathode rays were contorted, they carried negative charge with them. This, along with his demonstration of the deflection of cathode rays by charged electric plates in highly evacuated tubes, where screening didn't occur, finally settled the debate in favour of the explanation of cathode rays as a stream of charged particles. Having established that cathode rays were streams of charged particles, J.J. Thompson performed two experimental measurements of the charge to mass ratio of the cathode rays. In the one usually discussed in the HSC, he used a cathode ray tube shown here. Electrons are emitted from the cathode and then accelerate towards the anode, passing through two small holes so that only the electrons that are travelling in a straight line enter the rest of the tube. Thompson used two electrically charged plates to produce an electric field and ran current through two Hemholtz coils to produce a uniform magnetic field. In his experiment, he first switched on the magnetic field. As the magnetic force always acts perpendicular to the velocity of the moving charges, the rays were bent in the arc of a circle. Thompson used geometry considerations and measurements of where the rays hit the side of the tube to calculate the radius of the circular arc. Using Newton's second law, he could set the magnetic force that acted on the cathode rays equal to the centripetal force and rearrange the equation to obtain an expression for the charge to mass ratio of the rays. Thomson knew the magnetic field strength but didn't know the velocity of the rays. His next step was to switch on the electric field and adjust it until the deflection due to the electric field exactly cancelled the deflection due to the magnetic field. Rearranging, he could obtain an expression for the velocity in terms of the electric field strength and the magnetic field strength. Substituting this into his previous equation for Q over M, he could obtain an expression for the charge to mass that only contained known measured values. What was very exciting about the value he obtained was that it was big, so big that it either meant that cathode rays had a mass similar to that of a gas molecule, but a charge 1,000 times larger. Or alternatively, they had a charge that was equal to that of ionised gas molecules, but a mass that was 1,000 times smaller. Thompson went out on a scientific limb and suggested that the latter was true, that he had discovered a subatomic particle. He called them corpuscules. We now know them as electrons. A year or so later, Thompson was able to measure the charge separately to the mass, so obtained final confirmation of his discovery.